without further ado, this is the lecture on the formation of the French Republic. Formation of the French Republic. <clears throat> so by the second half of 1791, the wheels are coming off the wagon on the constitutional monarchy, mostly because of provincial opposition to the civil constitution, but also because of the fears generated by the intentions, whether in perception or reality, of the emigre princes, right? Those are the nobles who fled out to Germany, Holland, and other places for fear of the revolutionaries. The king's brothers were also ordered back to France to face removal from the royal line of succession. Uh, none of them came back because they weren't stupid. <laughs> yeah, all these anti-monarchy -monar uh, revolutionaries are like, yeah, guys, come back. We're just going to strip you of your power. We're totally not going to kill you. It was her. And they were like, uh, no, thanks. We're good. And then, in the autumn of the same year, 1791, we're still in, the German princes, hello, uh, the German princes profess solidarity with their French counterparts, so they're professing solidarity with the, emigre, the French emigre princes, so you see kind of a faction of nobles, you know, nobles backing other nobles, right? Kind of like you stick together with your class, socially. And so then... A conspiracy, arose, a conspiracy theory arose stating that the emigres would return at the head of a reactionary army that would restore the old regime. Back in France, the Legislative Assembly received the news of the provincial demonstrations and violence with dismay, right? We said there were demonstrations out in the provinces. Always a key thing to understand with France is that two main streams of thought, right? Everybody in Paris and then the rest of the country. They're polar opposites of each other. In the meantime, new French politics were crystallizing around young, ambitious men who were new to government, who were more inclined to dispense with the monarchy altogether. A lot of young, idealistic dudes. Lafayette's influence was waning. The important political club made up of these new newcomers called the Fouillon. Uh, I'll spell that. Is that a word we haven't gone over yet? No? Does this spell that new brand? So the French pronunciation of that is fouillon. What does that mean? Hmm? What does that mean? Uh, that's the that is the political club. Uh, the new the newcomers, and then they're gonna we'll go over this a little more. They split into two factions: the conservative faction and the radical faction. And understand when we say conservative, I'm not talking about like. Ted Cruz Tea Party conservative. This is just the non-radical group within the Fouillon. The conservatives were led by Antoine Barnav. I'll put that name up here as well. So he was friendly with the queen, and again, he's uh, kind of he's the head of the conservative uh, section. And then, 
the American example of republicanism, small r republicanism, was increasingly trumpeted by this faction, which becomes known as the Girondins. So, And then the radical party, or the radical section, the Trion, are the, and you've probably heard of these guys before, the Jacobins. They're the they're the more radical uh, Max Robespierre type. So, and both of these are pro-Republican groups, right? Because we said the Fouillon are in favor of the Republic. They want to dispose of the monarchy. And, they, and then they split into these two factions. Oh, I spelled this wrong. Wait, no. I, no, that's right. The Girondins were a mostly provincial uh, faction made up of middle-class professionals from the region of Gironde. What does that mean when, when I say middle-class professionals? What kind of, uh, uh, yes, what kind of jobs would those people have? Um, merchants, uh, right? artisans. Yeah, merchants, artisans, uh, lawyers, bankers. So these are people who don't have noble status, but are educated. And there's a decent chance that they're actually making more money than the nobles are. But because they're not nobles, what, what, um, what benefit do they not have? What are, what are the nobility and the clergy exempt from that uh, the third estate doesn't? Yes. Taxes. Taxes. These guys have to pay taxes. And so the Girondins also have an important female leader. Her name is Madame Roland. Put that up here as well. And her salon became a focal point uh, for politics and discussion. And we know that a when we say salon, that refers to what? Yes. No. That would be that would be a brothel. Yes, sir. For intellectuals, you should go to this gossip Right. So they, all these uh, intellectuals will go to somebody's house for dinner. And then after dinner, they'll all uh, have their whiskey glasses and they'll hold them like so. And they'll uh, discuss with each other philosophy and other theoretical things. And be like, oh, aren't we so intelligent? Oh, yes. Oh, we're so smart. Maybe you and someone decides to Yeah, uh, I mean, maybe they invited some ladies to the dinner who were a little sketch, but I, I wasn't there. Uh, the Jacobins, on the other hand, their support comes from lawyers and journalists who work in Paris. Again, we see the separation. These guys, we said, were provincial, and they have a more, they have a less radical leaning, and the Jacobins are all from Paris and they have the more, and their leaning is a little more extreme. Again, you see the difference between Paris and the rest of France. Their support came from small shopkeepers and ne'er-do-wells as well. The Girondins were 
especially concerned about the intrigue of the emigres, and were eager that, should the German princes kick him out, France would go to war to defend the revolution. They were certain that uh, France's armies would win a, an easy victory. Some figures, such as Lafayette, hoped that uh, uh, a French victory would put more ha uh, power in the hands of King Louis XVI, who enjoyed the loyalty of the army. Right, you're going to have a lot of monarchist support in the military. The Jacobins worried that France might be defeated and the revolution would just end right there. Victory would, as Lafayette estimated, mean more power for the king. But in the, in the end, uh, the German princes did expel the emigres. So all those French nobles who fled to Germany got kicked out. In March 1792, the Austrian Emperor Leopold II, or no, just Leopold, sorry, the first. Um, uh, what year? 1792. <laughs> So Leopold dies, 1792. His son Francis II So Leopold had uh, no intentions of getting into a row with the French. However, his son Francis was the complete opposite. He was uh, very eager to give the French a swift kick in the pants. <clears throat> Meanwhile, back in France, uh, this guy, Du Maurier, as you would say in the French pronunciation, uh, was appointed to the position of war minister. That would kind of be like our secretary of defense. Uh, no one has a department of war anymore. It's all called defense. It used to be called war. But he uh, he was hoping that a quick victory against the Austrians would make him the most powerful man in France. And after a belligerent message, or a few belligerent messages, passed between the French and Austrian government, the alliance, which had been formed between the Bourbons and the Habsburgs, was ended. In April 1792, France declared war on Austria, which marked the first in a long series of wars between France and the rest of Europe. This reminds me of that, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the Norm MacDonald clip when he was on the last episode of um, David Letterman, and he does this bit about Germany, and he said, in the early 20th century, Germany decided to go to war. And for their opponent, they picked the world. <laughs> and I know it's funny, but it was actually kind of close. Yes? When did it to France to declare war on Austria? April uh, 1792. So despite the bravado of the Girondins, right, they were eager to go to war, 
uh, they were totally unprepared for. The army had been among the most conservative elements of the country, right? Remember we said a lot of uh, monarchist support is going to exist in the military. The officer class was mostly made up of nobles, and many of them had fled into exile, and even the ones who are coming back are the ones that the Girondins want to go to war with. So the leadership in the military is almost non-existent in terms of officers which in combat is where a lot of your leadership comes from. So the officers that are available are very inexperienced. Officers were also responsible for training, and as such, uh, the French uh, foot soldiers were very much unprepared for battle. So you've got officers who don't know what they're doing, and a bunch of foot soldiers who have not really been trained. Previous wars in Europe had been mostly fought by professional armies, and artillery had become a determining factor on the battlefield. Basically, the way it would work in this time period would be if you had the superior artillery positioning, you would have to try really hard to screw it up. Right, if you have your cannons up on a hill and the other guy has his cannons down here, you basically got it. But artillery crews need a lot of training, they need a lot of experience. Uh, you can't just throw six guys on a cannon and say, go figure it out. I know you never did this before. But it takes a lot of time. Uh, and this is where you're gonna see, you're gonna see a movement in this time period away as I said, uh, Europe, most European armies before this had mostly been, had been uh, professional armies. So these are not, they're not very big. These guys, all they do is soldiering. A lot of the times they're made up of mercenaries. So you might have one year where a mercenary band is fighting for the French and then some German prince the following year offers to increase their pay by 10%. And before you know it, they're over there fighting with the Germans against the French who they were just fighting for. Now we're gonna see a movement away from that. Not just professional soldiers, but citizen military. And so you're going to see the number, the numbers uh, in terms of armies are going to go way, way up. Um, if, you listen, if you listen to Dan Carlin's Hardcore History when he does his World War I saga it's like six episodes long that's the one of the first things he talks about you should give it a listen it's really good <clears throat> so the question then becomes can the french citizen militia stand up to the veteran professional armies of austria and prussia uh france's general dormier First names, Charles Francois, uh, so he was, he was um, banking on the fact that Prussia wouldn't support their German-speaking rival, Austria. Uh, but he was wrong. Or wait, no. No, he was. He was. He was mistaken, and so France had to confront the combined strengths of Austria and Prussia. He was hoping for a short campaign in Belgium, but desertion and panic enfeebled the French armies. So you see that the quickly put together French citizen militia could not stand up to the professional German army. And the only thing that saved France at this time was because Austria and Prussia got bored. So they said, let's partition Poland. Like what else do you do, right? What else, what else did the Germans do in history aside from tear my country apart? Thanks.
Questions? Yes. He was the Minister of War in France. Uh, his years were... Oh, no, that's his lifespan. Uh, but in this time period, he gets promoted to Minister of War. He favors war with Austria, especially because he doesn't think that the Prussians will join in. And he banks on a quick... that they can quickly beat them up in Belgium. That doesn't happen because... France's army is mostly farmers thrown, you know, they throw a farmer a rifle and they're like, there you go. There's the, there's the, you know, if you're familiar with the American Revolution, there's the Hessians. Good luck. Uh, to be fair, one of the, probably the best map on the board was this farmer during the Ventral War. Yeah. A little Finnish guy. <laughs> <laughs> he just uh, killed us in the bushes. Hey, don't, don't sleep on farmers, man. I make fun of them a lot, but. So the Jacobin, Jacobin leaders like Robespierre and Jean-Paul Marat. Put Marat up here. Just for the hell of it. And again, that's the, uh, that's the more radical faction, Jacobins. So they want to take advantage of this as captivating, captivating public speakers. What do you think they did? They went out and grandstanded. They ripped the military leadership before the legislative assembly. In return, the generals blamed their soldiers for lack of discipline. That's a great way to win over your army, right? You're getting criticized for losing against the Germans. And what do you do as the general? You throw all your soldiers under the bus. Maybe if they didn't, maybe if I didn't have a bunch of farm boys, we could have won it. Thanks, General. I really appreciate it. And then the Jacobins blamed the Girondins for a foolhardy decision to make war on Austria. So everybody's finger pointing. Almost sounds like Congress. Counter revolutionary violence broke out again in the West and the South. As we continue to emphasize, the provinces outside of Paris are not in support of the revolution. A lot of pro-monarchy areas in the west and the south. In May, the Legislative Assembly moved uh, again. No, again, yeah. The Legislative Assembly moved again against non-juring priests, making them subject to exile. So you've got an attack on the clergy by the Legislative Assembly. And then they also disbanded the Royal Guard, which is the king's royal bodyguard. They'll come back soon here, though, don't worry. And Lafayette, seeing the complete chaos, said that they needed strong measures to save the government and reorganize the army. Well, thanks, Captain Obvious. In June 1792, a mob broke out at the Tuileries, which is the French royal palace in Paris, where the royal family had been hiding out since their flight to Varennes. Louis stood bravely and defended his family and refused to give in to the demands of the mob. Moderates were furious at the, at the humiliation of the king 
and royalist demonstrations were held throughout France. Lafayette attempted to persuade the National Guard, which was the successor to the Royal Guard. So you see what happens here is they try to get rid of the Royal Guard and they all just, they just give themselves a different name. And it's like, did you guys go home? No, we just, we rebranded ourselves. Now we're the National Guard. Yes? Uh, he attempted to persuade the National Guard to move against the Jacobins. I didn't, I didn't finish that sentence. I apologize. But he failed, so the National Guard refuses to go after the Jacobins. And then Lafayette becomes the favorite scapegoat of the radicals who supported the attack on the palace and called for the abdication of the king. For the abdication, yes. So Lafayette tries to get the National Guard to take out the Jacobins. The National Guard won't play ball. And so the Jacobins make a, another power move towards getting rid of old Louis. So why did the, the people of Frederick too annoying? Uh, they were... Pissed off? Yeah, basically. It was, a, it was a Parisian mob that just wanted to go after the uh, the Louis and his family. Okay. This happens every so often during the French Revolution. Louis is stuck in his castle with a mob outside. And as all of this is going on, the Prussians are getting ready to invade. In July of the same year, we're still in 1792, the Legislative Assembly printed circulars, so like pamphlets, uh, announcing, uh, announcing that La Partie was in danger, a national emergency was declared to which every patriot must rally. Right, so this is in response to the Prussians are about to invade. We don't really have a military. What do we do? So the government called for the enrollment of 50,000 volunteers for the army. They got a great response. 15,000 soldiers from Paris alone signed up. Now, as all of this is going on, the Girondins are kind of sitting over there, and they're like, well, this didn't turn out very well, kind of feeling like they've opened up Pandora's box, because as you remember, it's the, it's the Girondins, these guys, who wanted to go to war with Austria in the first place, which also then got them into the war with the Prussians, as the Prussians are about to invade. And so they kind of back off their calls to end the monarchy. They back off their calls for Louis to abdicate the throne. They're like, we didn't mean it. We swear. Wait, was it the same for Jacobins or the Girondins? Who start walking stuff back? Yeah. That's the Girondins. So the Girondins were afraid that too much was going on too quickly and that the masses would lead France into ruin and redistribution. For their part, the Jacobins assumed the anti-monarchy mantle. So as the Girondins kind of realized they screwed up, the Jacobins start rising in prominence. And the Jacobins begin to formulate a strategy to overthrow the monarchy. Any questions? 
Yes. Sir. Why did Bosa's tree keep our John O. Paul Murata to Bonnolte and Roland? Why did they all die in the same place? That's for later. The Great Terror is soon to come. Okay. Right, there's going to be, eventually, I'm not sure if it's in 1790, it could be just be coincidence, but eventually you're going to get the Great Terror uh, during the Revolution when everybody dies. Everybody. Those guillotines are just going and going and going and there's blood all in the streets and you get to the part where the revolutionaries eat their own, where the, you get certain, uh, as the Jacobins eventually rise to prominence, um, they start to turn on each other and, you know, they'll say, you know, they'll eventually they'll say to their, they'll even accuse their own leaders of not being uh, ideologically pure enough. And so if you're not ideologically pure enough, even if you're a Jacobin, the other Jacobins will ax you. Um, who is it? The, uh, there's the Abbe Saez, who was a, who was a priest who was, he was, he was in favor of the revolution for a while. Uh, he was kind of a Jacobin. And uh, he eventually had to flee because he was one of these guys who wasn't ideologically pure. And uh, so he, fled, he had to flee the country. He was afraid he was going to get axed. And afterward, after the revolution was over, uh, he was apparently asked by somebody, uh, what did you do during the revolution? And he said, I survived. That's all I've got. Uh, if you have any more questions, feel free. If not, you can uh, head out.